so we left off in Act 3, Scene 2, and I, I want to uh, conclude our study uh, with that scene, with uh, the Oberon speech to, to Puck, because now in Act 3, and I will say to you right now, uh, almost always in Act 3 of Shakespeare's plays, there is a crisis that builds, and it re reaches its pinnacle in Act 3. So there's a, a trajectory to the plot line in Shakespeare's play where it begins in a crisis usually of some small sort and the crisis keeps on building to the point where you're at the top of the ladder and actually the word crisis in Greek is a ladder, by the way, um, that if you, and, and um, or not, crisis is not a ladder, it's, uh, or am I, am I, what am I thinking here? Never mind. But it, it's building up the point where it, it might be actually be. It, it's the, if it's somebody's in critical condition, they're going to live or they're, they're going to die. That's what critical condition, it's a decisive decision point. Um, and they're either going, it's over, either it's going to tip over into tragedy or it's going to resolve itself in a comic fashion. Now in, uh, in the tragedies, as we'll see in Act 3, there's characteristically uh, a false dawn, a belief that, oh, this, I mean, this has looked like it was going very, very bad. And there's hope here that someone is coming in and may resolve it so it doesn't end badly. In comedies, it tends to be the exact opposite. It looks like this is about to end in suicides in the forest. And in fact, that seems entirely probable at this point. In, fa in fact, if intervention doesn't happen, that is what's going to ensue here. And uh, so it will go up and it'll hit a mountain peak and then it will resolve itself in comedy. And that's what we will see here. But it requires the intervention of Oberon once again. So the speech between Oberon and Puck here is helpful in that sense. Hermia leaves off saying, you know, Helena says, I will not trust you. I no longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands than mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer though to run away. Hermia, I am amazed and know not what to say. Oberon, who's been observing this, like the audience from the outside, we watching and he watching, uh, Oberon, this is thy negligence. So he's blaming Puck here. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest or else commits thy knaveries willfully. Believe me, king of shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far am I glad it so did sort. As this, their jangling, I esteem a sport. So he thinks it's very funny. Oberon, thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. High therefore, Robin, overcast the night, the starry well can cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Asheron, and lead, lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong and sometime rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property to take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wonted sight. When they next awake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision. And back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view and all things shall be peace. No, he still wants the child. 
But then I'll release her from the charm where, wherein she's infatuated with bottom and degrading herself. Only at that point. He's going to fix all of these things. Okay. Puck. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste. For night's swift dragons cut the clouds full fast. And yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards. Damned spirits all that in crossways and floods have burial already to their wormy beds are gone for fear lest day should, should look their shames upon. They willfully themselves exile from light and must for a consort with black-browed night. Oberon, but we are spirits of another sort. I, with the morning's love, have oft made sport, and I, like a forester, and like a forester the groves may tread even till the eastern gate, all fiery red opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt green streams. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay, we may effect this business yet ere day. And he leaves, and we have only Puck on stage, and he in rhyming couplet says this, up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town, goblin lead them up and down. Lysander comes in, and then he seeks to do what his master has just bid him. Uh, I'll pick it up, uh, up at Act 4, Scene 1, uh, with the commoners once again, uh, and the Queen of the Fairies with her. So we have as the staging, and note that in, in Shakespeare, the, the staging and the directions from, from the uh, playwright are very minimal. Contemporary uh, modern theater has very long, lengthy discussions of scening, scenery and so forth. Shakespeare may have had that as well, but in his notes, remember these are not, it's not his script. These are cribbed together from actors' notes, etc. I'm sure Shakespeare had a very clear idea of what he was doing and would have told them what to do. He hasn't put it in the text because he never intended to create a text for the public to read afterwards. Um, just, but, but this is what we have, and it tends to be the actors. Who's going to be on the stage right now? So enter Queen of Fairies, Titania, and Clown, bottom, and fairies, peace blossom, cow, uh, cobweb, moth, mustard seed, and others attending, and the king, Oberon, behind them, unseen. That's, you need that. So the Oberon is going to be backstage. We can see, we the audience can see him, but the audience front stage cannot. Now when you make a speech in the Shakespearean theater, especially when you make a soliloquy, you walk right front stage, front and center and you speak out to the audience, but you're thinking your thoughts. That's what you're doing. You're not speaking to the audience. You don't see the audience, usually. Now, if you do address the audience, then you're breaking through the, the fourth wall. And that does happen in Shakespeare's plays, but it's rare. Usually, you act as if they're not there, and it's, they act as if you can't see them, and vice versa. It's part of the pretense of it. Uh, and the pretense allows you to speak into a reality by, by living in a world that is not, I mean, you're suspending reality for a time while you're sitting watching a play for th two, three hours, whatever. You're forgetting the cares and concerns of the world and you're wholly engrossed in this real life situation as if it were possible for this to transpire. You're willing to suspend your other cares and concerns and we take delight in that if it's well done. So here we have Oberon, but the purpose of Oberon is like the playwright to make sure Puck doesn't screw it up again. We're going to make sure he gets it right this time. I, I've got to supervise this. Okay, so Titania, come sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek, smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. And bottom now, he is delighting in this. This is great. Where's Peace Blossom? Ready, scratch my head, Peace Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready, <clears throat> Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur, get you your weapons in your hand and kill me a red-hipped humble bee on the top of a thistle. And good Monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret yourself too much in the action. Monsieur, no, he's speaking in French, he's trying to be, <laughs> Monsieur, and good Monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I would be loath to have you overflowing with a honey bag, Signor. 
I'm mean, speaking Italian. <laughs> Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready? Give me your knee, Monsieur Mustard Seed. Who knows what a knee is? Pray you leave your curtsy, good Monsieur. What's your will? Nothing, good Monsieur, but but to help cavalry cobweb to scratch. I must to the barbers, Monsieur. For methinks I am marvels hairy about the face, and I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. Titania, what? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. The tongs and the bones, that's the music. You know, like you're whacking bones with the tongs, making a sound. Or, or, or say, sweet love, what wouldst thou desire to eat? Truly, a peck of provender, I could munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. He's an ass. He's going to eat what a donkey eats. That's... But he's acting like he is a multicultural, multi-polyglot, ethereal being. And yet he's eat, eating what a donkey eats, wanting to be scratched between the ears and et cetera, et cetera. So a ridiculous uh, scene, Oberon, enter Robin Goodfellow, Puck, Oberon, and it says advancing. So Oberon is backstage and now he walks a little bit toward the audience so the audience becomes aware of him. He was, we probably saw him when the scene started and then we've ignored him because the people speaking uh, attract our attention. But as he walks forward, we see him and then we give him our attention because he's, and now he's intervening. Advancing, welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity. For meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her. For she his hairy temples then had rounded with coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers, and that same dew which sometime on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now with the pretty floweriot's eyes, like tears that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairy land. And now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first I will release the fairy queen, touching her eyes. Be as thou wast wont to be, see as thou wast wont to see, Diane's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now. My Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Methought I was enamored of an ass. There lies your love. <laughs> how came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Silence a while. Robin, take off his head. Titania, music call and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five, the sense. Music, oh, music, such as charmeth sleep. Now, the music comes. What's with the music? The music uh, is, uh, I, and I've talked about this in various classes over the years, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it here because I won't get through the play. But music is an expression of harmony and concord. Again, it's hierarchical. The high notes, and, and you'll notice that in choirs, you'll have the sopranos, and the altos and the, tra and, and, and the tenors and the basses. And the, um, in a choir, the, everyone's waiting for the, tenor, for, the, uh, for the sopranos, the high sopranos. They're hitting the angelic notes. The others are there and they need to be that. It's part of a, 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 a chorus and, and a communal singing and the notes are all important, but the high notes are what you're looking for. The, they exalt you, they lift your heart up. <coughs> um, 
And Titania is, in terms of the lover, she represents the sopranos, and she's going to sing, and her song is going to set the uh, harmony into what was disordered at the beginning. So the music will play that role. Now, when it does so, it is in accordance with the cosmic harmony which we hear in the celestial spheres. Because in Shakespeare's day, they posited the idea of the music of the spheres. It's there from the ancient world. Uh, Boethius in his treatise on music talks about the music of the spheres. In fact, he talks about three forms of music. Um, and the music of the, of the spheres is the highest form of music inaudible to human ears, but it's the one that moves the stars and so forth. And, there, and, and the planets and the eight notes there that are structured with that. And those are mirrored by our instrumental music, which you can hear and you can perform. You can sing the notes on the scale. And you can, they're very mathematically precise because truth and beauty are in concord. And, and hence the importance of music. Plato regards music as essential to any good republic. He says, if you change the music, you destroy the people. That's how important he thinks it is. He's not making a, a fashion statement or a statement on his tastes in music. He's saying that music is of the order of things. If you don't acknowledge the order which is represented in music, you're going against hierarchy. If you prefer the bass, or dis, even worse, discord, to harmony, you're going to result in chaotic so social uh, life. So music, again, that is in discord or uh, lacks harmony is corrosive to the body politic. Shakespeare will think this. Note that uh, at the outset of this, Bottom's idea was music, of music was some bones rattling together. Well, it's, I guess it's forced music. But it's no, there's no harmony there. Human music needs to be in concord with celestial music. And again, it's mathematical. It's, it's, uh, uh, music is one of, the, one of the seven liberal arts, alongside with, uh, with uh, mathematics and geometry and astronomy. It, it's, it's the order of things. And we have to fit with the pre-existing order of things if we want concord in life. So that, Music of the spheres, which is inaudible, can be mirrored by instrumental music, but the reason why it plays upon us is that there's a music within us, within the human frame, that delights in that order. This is why we love music. Everyone loves music. Everyone hates bad music. Tastes can determine that even good music is bad music and vice versa, and the witness is what we hear around us all the time now, which is nothing but bad. And yet, it's fashionable. It's the, have you heard the latest thing? Yes, it's noise. It, it's just noise. It's sung by people who can't sing uh, with lyrics that are degrading or ridiculous, but usually just degrading of themselves and of their objects. Um, exalting the, the lowest, like bottom, they're the Titanias, but there's no Titania. It's just a marriage of horrid things. But Titania sings here, and her song is part of her part, and it's not a minor part. It's a major part in rectifying the discord which has come into the force. So when he brings her back online, that is Oberon, his wife Titania, she is through her song bringing about a, a resolution of the crisis. And note that we're in Act 4. And so now it's moving in that direction. Um, and this, I, I've chosen this particular play as a comedy because it, it illustrates these things on an, in an objective way like some comedies don't. This, it's very good for this. <clears throat> but when, Adam, when Bottom speaks here, we see that um, he's basically inarticulate. It's not that he doesn't use words, but he's incapable of describing the feelings of an animal in rational form. Like, bring me a bottle of hay. Like this nonsense. He, he, the, Titania, for all her efforts to ennoble him and make him more of a spiritual being, is, has failed. You can't make of an animal into, a, into an angelic being. It's not possible. And, and, so, and to some extent, Bottom's speech is a parody of poetry itself. Poetry being the expression of unseen ideas through imagery. And the images are not irrelevant. They have to be appropriate images. They have to be exalted images. So the choice of words is part of good poetry. 
and the best images have been used by poets past and they can be amplified. This is why we study the exact language and imagery that poets use and even, even I would say memorizing them is a very good idea. And you will see that the great poets like Shakespeare and Milton will uh, lay hold of images that their forebears used and they will then apply them slightly differently because again, they are Christians and their view of ultimate reality, God is different than that of the pagans. But still the images were in some ways appropriate and they'll just, they'll, they'll harmonize them. In a sense, they're doing part of the cultural mandate. They're undoing the effects of the fall in, in engaging with the, so here's the analogy that Augustine uses in De Doctrina Christiana, book two towards the end. He says that the cultures of this world are like the Egyptians. They have gold and they've used the gold for marvelous purposes in some sense, but they were used to, to worship idols. They don't know the proper use of the things around them. But God tells the Israelites to plunder the Egyptians, take their gold and leave with their gold. And he says, this is an analogy for what Christians ought to do with the goods of the world to take what is good and true and beautiful and repurpose it for its correct purpose, which is to worship God. Now note that the Israelites, this is my comment and I say it on the course when I teach this, note that the Israelites, when they take the gold from the Egyptians and the Egyptians give it to them as well, by the way, it goes both ways. But when they take the gold, what do they do with it? When they go out into the wilderness, they make a golden calf the exact same thing they did when they left. So you can get it entirely wrong. You've been given the gold, you're to, but what's the right use of the gold? Well, we don't find that until they build the temple, at which point it's inlaid with gold, the whole temple and the utensils are gold, etc. So it's used for the, the, there is a right use for it, but it, it, it requires thought. It requires cultivation. It requires uh, intent. It requires an understanding of the way God is as opposed to the idols. The Egyptians, the Israelites having been delivered there have not got transformed minds. God's done this for them and they don't appreciate it. And he's gonna let them die in the wilderness for it. But some will go on and rebuild this because God's purposes will not be thwarted. Anyway, this is what is happening in Shakespeare's plays as well, is that the playwright's purposes of transforming the world as he finds it. It's sinful, it's fallen, it's corrupted, it's broken, it's disordered, and in some ways it's just full of violence and de degradation can be uh, transformed into a godly uh, picture. And that's what the marriage scene is, right? It's the bride and the lamb. That it's, it's always being, so that picture of the bride and the lamb uh, which is in the book of Revelation at the end, is going to be exemplified in the comedies and the marriage scene at the end. And moving back to Athens, we're going to find that, that it's not just the couples that are going to be transformed, so is Athens itself. So Athens, the civilized place, is where the marriages will take place. And Oberon is aware of this. We can't have the marriage out here in the forest, and we're going to stay in the forest. That's not a human realm. So uh, the inarticulate speech of bottom reflects the inability to transform nature uh, outside of its God-given hierarchy. You can't make an ass into an angel. And, um, and bottom's attempt to, that, to do that just shows how vain human attempts are to perfect things without uh, living in concord with God's, when, uh, God's work. Um, and he tries to hear, that is Shakespeare, to convey the borderline between the world of dreams and the world of reason. Hermia says, methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. When everything seems double. Um, and we, we transport ourselves back to Athens. Note how short Act 4 is. We have Act 4, Scene 1. There's a very brief Scene 2, and then we move to Act 5. Um, this uh, final act I'll say much more about in, in a second. Uh, oh, one, one comment, the Dianes, but uh, Diana is a, uh, a virgin. But here it's not a fruitless chastity, it's a chastity in conformity with divine love. 
it's the chastity of the sort. Remember at the outset, the punishment was to be sent to a nunnery, but it's meant as a punishment. Here, it, the, uh, and, and as we know in, in scripture, it speaks of those who've been called to be celibate to worship God, being a, in a sort of a marital relationship with God. There's an exclusivity already there that's anticipating what everyone will experience in the eschaton where there is no marriage. And they're receiving that as an anticipation of that. And Diane's bud here is in that sense. It's not, uh, he's not giving his wife to Tanya to be a uh, chaste in that sense, as in without fruit. Uh, it will be a fruitful, imaginative resolution. So she falls out of love with Bottom and falls back in love with Oberon. But note that there's something sordid about it because he has only done it once she gives him the child. Yeah, I got the boy now. Aha, I've won. So, you know, what's going on with the boy and why does uh, this matter to him? That's simply unstated. Um, but the, a hierarchy has been restored and it corrects and it exerts power over Titania and she gladly accepts this. And their argument is resolved and the stage is set for the reconciliation of all the lovers. So, it, and it's interesting, until the higher characters had their quarrels resolved, the lower could not. So, in, in a sense, it's a quarrel with, just like in the pagan epics where there's a quarrel with the gods that spills over into quarrel on earth, same sort of thing is happening here. And uh, this is things, these are things that uh, I think even Christians often ignore, that there is a spiritual war that Ephesians 6 talks about, a war in the cosmos, which we partake in even in our family life. It's part of a bigger war. And the way of combating it is actually domestically ordering your own house. It's not fighting world wars. Those are cosmic wars. Those, the, the world wars is, are no way of creating lasting peace. There's a cosmic war, spiritual war going on which you will address through your family ordering. That's what Ephes the book of Ephesians is about, is about ordering your family rightly. And that will spill over into social life, etc. But that's part of the big cosmic war which comes at the end of all that. Um, anyway. Uh, we return to Athens. And the scene here of Theseus and Hippolyta, etc. And let's pick it up there because we haven't seen these fellows in quite a while. It's line 103. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegis, and all his train. Go, says Theseus, one of you, find out the forester, for now our observation is performed. And since we have the voward of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western valley, let them go. Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. Exit an attendant. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. Hippolyta, I was with Hercules and Cadmus once when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never did I hear such gallant chiding, for besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, so flued, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crook kneed and dew lapped like the thessal Thessalian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched in mouth like bells, each under each. A cry more tunable was never hollowed to, nor cheered with horn in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear, but soft, what nymphs are these? Let me just stop here. They're going to, there's going to be a hunt. It's an aristocratic pursuit. There's a tune going on. There's a, it's, it's an ordering. They are both delighted with the, this. There's a, a, again, a music is, is uh, passing through as a, as a leitmotif through the, 
the story. Uh, what nymphs are these? Aegis. My lord, this my daughter here is asleep, and this Lysander, this Demetrius is, this Helena, old Nidar's Helena. I wonder if they're being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent, come here in grace. Remember the context, the Earl of Southampton, a marriage during May Day, that festival, so there's an audience uh, for this. They're observing the rite of May, hearing our intent, came here in grace of our solemnity. But speak, Aegis, is not this the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It is, my lord. Go bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Accident attendant, shout within. The, uh, they wind their horns. They all start up. Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine is past. Begin these wood birds but to couple now. Pardon, my lord, they kneel. I pray you all, says Theseus, stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world? That hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate and fear no enmity. Lysander, my lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking, but as yet, I swear, I cannot truly say how I came here, but as I think, for truly would I speak, and now I do bethink me, so it is. I came with Hermia hither, our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law, enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would, Demetrius, thereby to de have defeated you and me, you of your wife and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. Demetrius, my lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth and of this their purpose hither to this wood, and I in fury hither followed them, fair Helena in fancy following me, but my good Lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia, melted as the snow seems to me now as the re resem remembrance of an idol god, which in my childhood I did dote upon and all the faith, the virtue of my eye, my heart, the object and pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her, my Lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but like a sickness did I loathe this food. But as in health, come to my natural taste. Now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. So it's like when you lost your taste with COVID and you couldn't eat things or it's, uh, things don't taste right. Well, there's something, there's nothing wrong with the, f the food's not changed, but something within us was at odds with that. We, we're, we're sick, we've lost our taste, or even things taste bad that we like. And now he's retained his natural taste. He's been tuned. The, the sickness has been purged, whatever it was, and however it happened. Theseus, fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse, we more will hear anon. Idris, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by, with us these couples shall eternally be knit. And for the morning now is something worn. Our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us to Athens, three and three. We'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta, and off they go. Um, Let me just jump over the Demetrius and Hermia and Helena, the speeches here, um, because they're all rectified and they're looking forward to what is about to ensue. Suddenly, Bottom wakes up. Everyone else has left the stage and Bottom is left there. Note the way in which the text is presented to us here. There is no rhyme, there is no meter, there's Bottom restored to his self and he is as incomprehensible as one could be. Awaking, when my cue comes, call me and I will answer. 
My next is most fair Pyramus. Hey ho, Peter Quince, flute the bellows mender, snout the tinker, starveling, God's my life, stolen hence and left me asleep. I've had a most rare vision. I have had a dream, past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. Me thought I was, there is no man can tell me what. Me thought I was, and me, th and me thought I had. But man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what me thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste his eye. Now he's trying to quote scripture and he just can't get it right. Uh, no tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballet of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. And I will sing it in the latter end of a play, before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Okay, now the other uh, figures come in and prepare for the final uh, scene and the performance of their own play. The play within the play, the commoners have prepared it for the marriage feast of Theseus and Hippolyta, which is now a marriage feast of the other lovers as well. So we have multiple marriages all brought in concord by the harmony restored between Oberon and Titania. So what has happened in the supernatural realm, having been resolved, will now echo force and ripple through uh, among the pair of, uh, pairs of human lovers. So Act 5, Scene 1, Theseus summarizes and adds to the lessons taught about the power of the imagination and expresses the attitude that the lover's story might not be quite true. And the poet representing the highest powers of the imagination, which are uh, associated with the moonstruck, the lunatic and the lover, uh, gives form to things unknown. Let me just read this. Hippolyta, Theseus, Philostrate, lords and attendants. So it's the aristocrats on stage. Hippolyta, tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antic fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. Uh, that is the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed a bear. So Theseus disparages the imagination. It can lead anywhere. It could be, if, it, if it's in the, the lunatic, he sees demons everywhere. Hell is everywhere. If it's a lover, he can love pretty much anything rather than Helen of Troy, a brow of Egypt. So somebody who's not beautiful. It's not a slight on Egyptians. Shakespeare knew no Egyptians. Don't let the Egyptians be offended. Reference to uh, Egypt probably in the biblical sense here then, right? And finally, the poet, just like the other two, he can create fictions, fantasies out of nothing that have no purpose or meaning. Now, this is the perspective of Athens. Athens, the philosopher, the philosopher speaking against the poet. It doesn't represent Shakespeare. This is Theseus's take on this. Still, he, he as a reasonable being, is going to speak order into it and find harmony as a result of the imaginative work that we have seen. And Hippolyta answers him accordingly. But all the story of the night told over and all their minds transfigured so other 
more witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. So her rejoinder to Theseus is actually, whatever you say about this, they have been transformed in a way that we can clearly see. You may not be able to reason after it, and yet the results you have to acknowledge. So there is something that's happened here, even if their story might not be entirely credible. Um, okay, so now the lovers, the pairs of lovers enter, Lysander, Demetrius, Hermia, and Helena. Here come the lovers, Theseus says, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy in fresh days of love, accompany your hearts. Lysander, more than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Theseus, come now. What masks, what dances shall we have? Now, the mask is a type of dance that's performed in certain occasions. Milton writes, comus a mask. A mask is a, a type of performance very common in this day. In Catholic, and it's actually a Catholic form of theater um, that Milton adapts. Um, we don't need to talk about Milton here, but it's a, it's a uh, a, a musical reenactment and which includes uh, dances and so forth often performed at wedding services and the Earl of Southampton doubtless had a mask performed here as well but uh, come now what masks what dances shall we we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime where is our usual manager of mirth what revels are in hand is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour, call Philostrate. Hear, mighty Theseus, say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask, what music? How shall we beguile the lazy time, if not with some delight? Philostrate. There is a brief, how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your highness will see first, giving a paper. You can have this, you can choose this, the entertainment for the evening between having eaten and going to bed, which would you prefer? Theseus reads, the battle with the centaurs to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. No Athenian eunuchs singing to the harp. But have I told my love in glory of my kinsman Hercules, the riot of the tipsy bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage? That is an old device. And it was played when I from Thebes came last a conqueror. And here reading another one. The thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. That, that is some satire, keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. Third off, 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 offering. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical, tedious and brief. What is hot ice and wondrous strange snow? How shall we find the concord of this discord? So this is the third, and it's the play of the commoners that he's now considering. And, Th and Philostrate says, a play there is, my lord, some ten words long, <laughs> which is as brief as I have known a play, which, but by ten words, my lord, it is too long. <laughs> which makes it tedious. For in all the play, there is not one word apt, one player fitted. And tragical, my lord, noble lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water. But more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it, says Theseus, because he realizes the commoners are trying to offer their gifts, like the little drummer boy. They've come their gifts to bring. ba rum pa pum pum Right? So they're going to bring their gifts, and it's a very ridiculous 10-word play, which is laughable, laughably bad. But Theseus 
wanting to, with a reformed mind, wants to delight in his subjects in whatever they offer him, however unfitting and suitable by uh, a cultivated mindset, still he's going to receive this out of condescension. It's condescension. He's not mocking them. He's going to take delight in, he's going to receive it, and he's going to, hard, it's going to be hard to suppress his laughter, but still. Okay, so we will hear it. No, my noble Lord, it is not for you. I've heard it over, it, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain and to do you service, I will hear that play. For never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty render it, tender it. Go bring them in and take your places, ladies. Exit Philostrate. Hippolyta, I love not to see wretchedness or charged and duty in his service perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall no such thing, see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. The kinder we. Now, here's Theseus speaking to Hippolyta. Uh, we are going to act as nobility. We can reform what is basically ludicrous. How can we do that? Through condescension. And again, Shakespeare has in mind here, how has God treated us through his charity, through his love that is not like ours? We shall do likewise. It's going to be uh, from the vantage point of Philostrade, from the vantage point of the audience, this is a ridiculous play. And there's nothing good in it. It's, not, uh, it, it's hard to even look upon. But Theseus, the kinder we, to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake, and what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have purposed to meet me with premeditated welcomes. Where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practiced accent in their fears, and in conclusion dumbly have broke off, not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, out of this silence, yet I picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much as from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most to my capacity. So what is the vantage point here? It's a love, he's showing them charity. Charity modeling the agape love of God for his people, where they, again, are not lovable, and yet he loves them. This is, is Theseus modeling the reordering of things in accordance with his attempt to portray God, Christ's love for the world. That's what's going on here. And he doesn't say that, but he uh, doesn't make a, a explicitly theological reference, but that's the uh, import of his words here. They don't deserve my condescension, and I am going to give it to them. And believe me, even when I get people who are giving me appropriate um, reverence, I still have to condescend, uh, just as God does. Again, that runs through the whole cosmos. Okay, enter Philostrate. So please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. Flourish, trumpet. Enter Quince for the prologue. <laughs> the prologue. If we offend, it is with our good will <laughs> that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite, we do not come as minding to content you. Our true intent is, all for your delight, we are not here. That you should here repent you, the actors are at hand, and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know. So the prologue is just sheer nonsense. We've come... Uh, 
if we offend you, it's our good will. Like, like, like repeated, you would never say such things as he says here. It's the beginning of the farce that ensues. Um, and I'm going to skip over the, the, the whole play because the play is completely ridiculous, but, but great fun. And if it's seen as such by the audience as well, and you recognize, you're not going to get any sense out of this because this is just extremely poorly done. Uh, ludicrously, as badly done as can possibly be done. And yet, th the question as much as anything is observing the spectacle that then ensues is in understanding how the king, Theseus, is receiving the play and how we, the audience, should do likewise. How should we regard our fellow human actors? As much as they offend us, as much as they're sinful, as much as they are offensive, how should we act towards others? We're to love our enemies. Here, the, uh, the regal Theseus is going to receive the offering of his common folk, as pitiful as it is, with magnanimity. And uh, towards the end of this, um, bottom towards the end of it says, starting up, um, uh, the, uh, it's, it's humorous and they're de the dead on the stage, stabbing, dying, and so forth. And then Theseus says, rather tongue in cheek, moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. <laughs> and and um, I and wall too. So the wall, because the wall's been moving around the whole time. Anyway, bottom starting up. No, I assure you, the wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue or to hear a Bergamasque dance between two of our company? No epilogue, I, I pray you. For your play needs no excuse. Never excuse. For when the players are all dead, there need not to be blamed. Mary, if he that writ it had played Pyramus, and had hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy. And so it is, truly, and very notably discharged. But come, your Bergamask, let your epilogue alone, the iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve lovers to bed. Tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn as much as we this night have overwatched. This palpable gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight hold we this solemnity uh, in nightly revels and new jollity. Exunt leaves the stage. Who do we have left? Puck's the only one that's there right now, and we'll see that Oberon Titani will come in as well. And so it concludes with the speakers. We have the commoners speaking, then we have the regals, and then we will have the fairies. Enter Puck with his fame speech. Now the hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task fordone. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide, every one lets forth its, his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream, now are frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. And now the king and queen of the fairies all their train, Oberon. Through the house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire, every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird from briar. And this ditty after me, sing and dance it trippingly. Titania, first rehearse your song by rote. To each word a warbling note, hand in hand with fairy grace will we sing and bless this place. Oberon, now until the break of day through this house, each fairy stray to the best bride bed will we, which by us 
shall blessed be. And the issue, there create, ever shall be fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true in loving be. And the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand. Never mole, hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious, such as are despised in nativity, shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate, every fairy take his gate, and each several chamber bless, through this palace with sweet peace, and the owner of it blessed ever shall in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay, meet me all by break of day. Out they go. Note at the end there, the, the rhyme, the multiple rhyme, heavy rhyme, and so a strong rhymed conclusion, emphatic. And they go out, and what we have left is Puck. Now Puck is going to then walk up stage, stand at the front, and how does he address, well he addresses the crowd directly. So he breaks through the fourth wall and speaks to the audience as if he were just a man and not the player, but of course he is still Puck, but what does he say? If we shadows have offended, now remember the offense, the, the Oberon has, uh, uh, or Theseus rather has said, we will condescend and receive this. Oberon likewise, so we have the two aristocratic or the kingly figures modeling how we are to treat the play, the poor play in front of us, Puck comes forward on behalf of the company and says the same thing to the audience. The audience is to respond in regal kind. There's a little bit of tongue in cheek here. We're treating you, our lords, to the commoners as well. If, this, if we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have er unearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands. And they all, the actors always feel like they have to show the audience as if they don't understand. It drives me crazy. Give me your hands. And they're like, you, know, mm, you stupid people. Give me your hands if we be friends and Robin shall restore amends. And maybe they do need the prompting. I don't know, but you shouldn't have to say, yeah, I mean you to clap now, yes. So, right? Patronizing, annoying. I don't think Puck is supposed to be patronizing and annoying by having to do this, like, Let me, give me your hands. Oh, I'm supposed to clap. Anyway, so that, and the play ends there, but he breaks through the fourth wall and he's speaking, so give me your hands is directing to you. So I acknowledge that you are out there. Uh, and, and so the play uh, and the pageant on the stage is applied directly to the audience and we know that it's didactic and you are to do as you've just seen here. It's part of the harmony, it's part of the way in which theater and the imagination which has been displayed uh, in acting on the stage will then spill over into the life of those who have observed it. So that's Shakespeare's um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Noblesse oblige is what we see demonstrated here, allowing the commoners to display their duty as subjects. And uh, there's a meta-dramatic element here, as I say, directing the audience to use their imagination. Um, it does show the illusion of the theater, but, it, but, but it's a, it's a a device of conspicuous artifice here. You're aware that it's a play. I'm aware that it's a play. I draw attention to the fact that there's a play going on, and yet I am saying that even though it appears to just be entertainment, there's more at work here, and you know it. There's more at work. And the fact that it is fanciful, artificial, is irrelevant. It still has an application to life, and he's brought the various features of life into the performance. So this is Shakespeare, this is A Midsummer Night's Dream. It is very different than modern comedies because it has that broader implication of life that is not just a, a social expression but then brought into the cosmic order and the way things actually are. This is the way to rectify all wrongs. 
So I think it's uh, quite magnificent, and it's a great illustration of the comic genre. I sort of I could have chosen uh, all sorts of them. This one's really good, uh, and it, as I say, I chose it in part because it addresses the imagination which the Romantics have appropriated for themselves, and uh, to some degree deprived us of the uh, the traditional view. You know, it tends in one of two directions, and also the view of nature. And note at the end, uh, Shakespeare affirms the hierarchy and shows how hierarchy rightly rules. It began with the, those who rule by right threatening to kill everyone that opposed their rule. It ends with the, those same figures condescending and receiving with, with gladness the obedience paid to them. So everything is harmonized in the end. Okay, any comments or questions? It's a good way to begin the course in Shakespeare. So as I said, this is a comedy, so it, begin, it concludes with it with marriage, uh, as Shakespearean comedies do. It's not true of ancient comedy. Uh, if you see any examples of ancient comedy, they don't end with marriages. That's, that is the development of, of Christian thought and seeing God's own relation to his people as something like a comedy. Dante puts his signature on it by calling the, the, uh, his work the Commedia. Others call it the divine comedy because it's talking about the relations of God to human life. And Shakespeare is representing that view. It's the biblical view. And it transforms the genre of the comedy. We'll also see it will affect the tragedy as well. But we'll come to that next time. I think we're doing measure for measure next time. Is that not correct? Yes. And then we'll move on to a, um, The Tempest.